Welcome to the show. I'm Chris Graham, and we're on Augusta Free Press on Facebook. And for our listeners on the podcast, thanks for joining us as well. The show is Street Knowledge. I will be flying solo today for the first time in a while. Um, as we talk uh, some UVA sports, today's news, gosh, the uh, basketball team, the number four ranked team, which two days ago looked so good, today looked average and lost to a team in San Francisco that you wanted to say you know, when you first saw, especially that this team was playing its third, t- third game in three days, and one of those games was a loss to UMass Lowell by eight points two days ago. Uh, you, you know, certainly you thought coming in, hey, Virginia will we'll probably handle this one pretty easily. Um, I get the sense from Tony Bennett's post-game talk with reporters that maybe he thinks that there could have been some headline uh, reading uh, by some of his guys, and this, as a result, could be a, a wake-up call, to say the least. Um, San Francisco is a good team. Uh, yes, they've also lost UMass Lowell two days ago, but they won 22 games a year ago. Uh, they probably would have been an NIT team or maybe even a CBI team because uh, they, they did make the West Coast Conference uh, Tournament Championship and lost by four points to Gonzaga. They got swept by Gonzaga, lost all three games, but two of those losses were by four points. I test they were probably an NCAA tournament team last year, but metrics, probably not. Um, but 22 wins with, with that showing against the best team on our schedule. They're a good team, and they were looking forward to this season being a, 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 a sort of a jump-ahead season, right? So, um, you know, they, they came in, and, and, and one thing this young Virginia team will learn, and I say young, yeah, some of the better players, you know, Sam Huff is, is, a, is a redshirt senior because he transferred Sam Hauser, and then Jay Huff uh, is also a redshirt senior because he, he redshirted the year back early in his career. Older guys, PA Clark's a junior, and he's played a lot of a lot of time. Uh, was was a key player on the team two years ago as a freshman that won the national championship. Uh, but there's a lot of guys playing new roles. Sam Hauser's a, a new guy in a sense, even though he's a redshirt senior. You know, he, he's he transferred from from Marquette. He sat out last year. Um, you can see he's still learning the pack line defense responsibilities. Sam just looked forward to that a bit today. Uh, we'll talk about that more uh, later in the, in the in the podcast here show here. Um, you know, then you got you got other young guys. Uh, Reese Beekman played a lot today. Uh, he's a he's a true freshman point guard. I'll play more. I'll talk about that. Justin McCoy is a, is a sophomore. Uh, he's playing some big minutes, uh, but he's he's a newcomer. As a result, you know, there's there's that aspect. Uh, and so, and of course, this team is is you know so, so many guys are kind of being moved around. Uh, no excuse. Uh, everybody's going through the same thing. But you can see that that you know this team um isn't what they're going to be um and if sam hauser's shot at the end goes in they win the game they're still i mean they get the win but there's not much different they, they were outplayed today virginia was outplayed today um it speaks more to what they do in terms of their grit that they lost by one and had the last shot to win the game because san francisco just thoroughly outplayed virginia today uh, 40 points in the second half for san francisco on 29 possessions um, you know, just that's that's an otherworldly stat against a Virginia team. And um, and Virginia only had five assists. San Francisco took Virginia out of what it likes to do offensively. It's a, it's a team that shares the ball a lot. You saw that uh, on Wednesday in the win over Towson, 17 assists on 35 made baskets. Today, five assists on 21 made baskets. A lot of Hubro ball. Um, you know, I remember early in the game, um, Trey Murphy, the third, who had the big game a couple of nights ago, um, and, and today struggled like everybody struggled today. Um, he, he grabbed a rebound on the defensive end and, and went coast to coast, got fouled, made the two free throws, but it kind of, that was emblematic, even though that one was successful, kind of emblematic of what uh, the situation was for Virginia today. A lot of one-on-one ball. It seemed like the game plan was, hey, we know San Francisco is going to put basically a five guard lineup on the floor uh, offensively. So if they're going to play small, we're going to take them to the bucket. Uh, and Virginia went to the bucket a lot, 22 shots at the rim, 12 in the first half, only two of 12 in the first half at the rim. And uh, in in, in overall, eight of 22. Uh, you know, I, I looked up the numbers from last year's team. Last year's team, which was offensively challenged, to say the least, shot 58.8% at the rim. And that's, you know, low for most teams. But even if you factor that in, uh, Virginia would have been 13 of 22 today. You win by nine or 10 points if those shots go in. They just, they weren't tough. And Tony Bennett said so after the game. He said, we, we went to the basket, but then we shot away from contact. Um, 
get to the foul line, maybe, you know, then the, those, those convert. And, and, and so there was that issue. And then with all the drives to the basket, and maybe some of those could have been kicked out to, to open shooters on the perimeter like they were two days ago. But instead today, they were trying to finish at the rim. Only, 11, uh, only 12 three-point attempts, I should say, 11 until the, the final miss by Hauser. Um, and three of 12 after going 15 of 29 two days ago. So, uh, you know, you, you weren't as tough. You, you weren't as stout defensively. Uh, you know, the, the, the five guard approach, and I say five guard, it's probably more like four guards and one power forward, but the largely small ball approach from San Francisco and spreading the floor, call it a five high offense, basically. You see some NBA teams do this, and you can actually see a lot of NBA teams do this these days. Um, where, where you, you spread the floor so much, you're really not clogging things up with a guy in the post or with screen and rolls. Uh, and, and second half really ran this offense uh, almost exclusively. Um, even in the first half, their screen and rolls were high screen and rolls, very high screen and rolls. I mean, like half, you know, split the difference between the end of the three-point line and, and half court, they were so high on those pick and rolls uh, to allow the dribblers to have a lot of space to create. Uh, and, and make those Virginia defenders defend one-on-one. -on -one. The pack line defense is predicated upon um, help. You know, you funnel your guys to the pack, and then your, your, your pack helps out. Uh, and so when you spread the floor the way they did, it took advantage of Sam Hauser in one respect, and Sam's going to get better at this. But as a four in this defensive alignment, uh, he's not just responsible, and no one in a pack line is just responsible for their guy, but you could see it on a couple of those plays where San Francisco on, on screens, uh, ball screens and, and screen and rolls and, and, and dribblers dribbling through screen and rolls, refusing and then going through. Um, Hauser would have been the guy behind to maybe slow the guy up, maybe slow that ball handler up or slow the screener up. Uh, but he was he was so focused on his guy that there was no help behind. And so, um, you know, that that exploited the guards a bit today. Um, that'll change. I mean, he'll get better at that. He's, he's a year in the program, but when you when you're in the scout team as a red shirt, um, you're largely you know playing against the, the the regulars, and you're not really getting the reps and practice in in the pack line, and you've only had that those reps for the last few weeks, uh, and so he'll get better at that. Um, but in the meantime, boy, you know, looking inside the numbers, I pointed this out in a column. Uh, we do those inside the numbers columns uh, after every game. And this was this was shocking. Um, and I say this, I, I've subscribed. I've I've been making it a point the last uh, the last few months. Um, I, I we can't beat the games as much uh, because of COVID, and so I got to be a better writer in other senses. And so I've I've been subscribing to the really in depth stats packages, Pro Football Focus for for football, uh, and Synergy Sports offers really good insight uh, through its stats. And I've I've subscribed to them and. It's interesting to see uh, the breakdown on, on Kihei Clark one-on-one -on -one defense. Kihei Clark earned his minutes two years ago as a ball hawk uh, by just aggressively defending Ty Jerome, who's now in the NBA in practice. And, you know, at some point, Tony Bennett in that October said, if this kid is making a, basically a future NBA player work this hard, maybe I should give him some minutes. Uh, and Kia was a very valuable member of that national championship winning team in 2019 with his ball hawking defense. I don't know what it is. Uh, the last two games, and, and, and Synergy gives us this, uh, on the aggregate for, through two games, uh, Clark's guys have been six of six uh, shooting coming off pick and rolls. Um, and, and the rest of the team uh, has forced 11 misses on 14 such offensive plays. Spot up guys, Clarks are, are four of eight. The rest of the team uh, has allowed eight of 27. Uh, overall, his guys one on one are 11 of 17 from the floor. And in, in possession being used against KA Clark, uh, the opponents are scoring 1.56 points per possession. This for a team that, including his number, is allowing 0.833 um, points per possession. So uh, I mean, you factor in then that his offense has not been very good. His offensive points per possession is 0.762. Uh, he's shooting 4 of 11 from the floor, which is 36%. He has six turnovers, 23.8% turnover rate. Kia Clark is, is he's not playing himself out of the lineup, but he was second team preseason all, all ACC. He's playing nowhere near that right now. Fortunately for Virginia, and a reason they were able to stay in this game, Reese Beekman, uh, the top, he was the number 51 recruit in the ESPN 500 this year, four-star point guard. Um, 
coming out of Louisiana, he had 11 points today uh, in 27 minutes. And uh, largely when you, you know, add them up, it's not quite perfect, but he, he took the minutes that Casey Morsell had been getting. Casey got to start again today at the, at the second guard spot. Uh, but he played 13 minutes, so I, I haven't looked at the play-by-play -play to the depth to find out if he was on the floor at the same time as Casey or if it just worked out that 27 plus 13 equals 40. But, um, you know, effectively, he replaced Casey in 27 minutes, 5 of 6 on the floor, made a 3, a uh, couple breakdowns defensively, and, and he admitted after the game he's got to work on his defense. But um, he had a, a team sec second-best efficiency rating on the team. Uh, his efficiency rating was 13. And his game score was 8.1 according to stat broadcast. And that was um, actually 9.1. And his, his was the best on the team. It was Justin McCoy who had the 8.1 second best on the team. Beekman looks like a guy that's going to be hard to keep off the floor. Uh, and, and I would not be surprised if uh, next week when Virginia returns home uh, for the home opener in JPJ with no fans, um, if you don't see Beekman starting alongside Kia Clark. Uh, and maybe even taking on, I mean, I don't know. He's not known for his defense, you know, as much as he is certainly what he can do on offense. But, uh, you know, Kia Clark on those minutes two years ago, uh, he, he would you know, eventually started a lot of those games for Virginia as, as that season wore on. And he took on the tough defensive assignment, allowed Ty Jerome to kind of play off ball more. Um, I don't know. Kia Clark, uh, I mean, he's having some issues. And, it's, and if nothing else, Beekman can maybe help run the offense a bit. Um, and... Um, and, and open some things up there, but that's an issue that was that was that was raised today uh, for this Virginia team. Another issue was Jay Huff. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't get the angry Jay Huff. We had the nice Jay Huff. Jay Huff's a nice young man. Anyone who's had the pleasure to meet him, talk with him, uh, he is just a stand-up young man. I mean, he's you know he's a very religious young man. Um, you know, he met his future wife. Yes, he's married. He's a senior in college. He's married. He, they met. Uh, in a campus religious organization at UVA, um, just a salt of the earth guy. I mean, he's and he's going to be he's going to be he's going to do a lot, but he's going to play in the NBA. I assume I mean, his talent says it screams NBA. But he's going to you know after the NBA is over, he's going to spend the rest of his life you know doing great things. I'm sure leading a church somewhere and, and, and that kind of thing. But between the lines, he, we've seen the angry Jay Huff. Think of the Jay Huff that. Blocked the shot of Vernon Carey Jr. on that pick and roll with five seconds left. Grabbed the rebound, snarled. He had that. He grabbed the ball. There's a picture of him with the, with the book. Um, he had 15 points, nine rebounds, 10 blocks in that game. He missed. He almost had a triple double with blocks against Duke. Um, today he shot the ball twice. He had a little running shot on the uh, second possession, I think, of the second half. Uh, and then he, he missed a three kind of badly early in the shot clock, uh, about 2.30 to go. And his, his niceties uh, hurt Virginia at the end. Uh, after getting the rebound on the missed front end of the one-and-one, one, uh, Tony Bennett had used Virginia's last time out uh, to ice the shooter, which worked, got the, got the, got the miss. Um, uh, but with using your last time out, he had to call uh, the plays. Basically, okay, if he makes – no shots, here's what we do. He makes one, here's what we do. He makes two, here's what we do. And it looks like they ran the play for if he, he made both. <laughs> because they, they, they ran a play, T.A. Clark getting the ball to the floor, uh, dribble penetrating, you know, about midway in the lane for the kick out back to, to Huff, who was trailing the play for the open three. And we've seen Virginia run this play a number of times. It's a very effective play because Huff is a big target at the three-point line at the top of the key, you know, just outside the top of the key. Huge target. You're not going to miss him with that pass. Uh, and, of course, your momentum's going forward. So, I mean, he's got the, the beautiful stroke from that range. It's a straight-on shot. He's 7-1, so it feels like he's reaching out already halfway through. It's almost like a free throw for him. He gets the pass, and he's reluctant. And I have a thought in my head that it's, it may be because he had missed that shot with 2.30 to go on, in the corner and missed it so badly that maybe in his mind, hey, I don't want to shoot this ball. I don't want to be the guy to shoot it. So Sam Hauser was a second option. Hauser came off a down screen. And um, Hauser's your best shooter. Uh, but he's also, he was, he was coming off the screen. Uh, he was, you know, going over his body momentum was carrying him away from the hoop and actually a little bit off to the left as well. Uh, and he did have a defender's hand in his face. Didn't get a good look and missed a shot. I mean, honestly, 
uh, you would rather Jay Huff going forward in, with momentum taking him towards the basket, um, you know, to, to take that shot as opposed to Hauser running off the screen and, and falling away. Um, but it is what it is. You know, it didn't happen. Um, on, also, though, I mean, you know, you're down one. Why, you know, why not dribble penetrate? Go to the line, maybe get the line. They were in the – they were at least in the one and one. Um, you know, you, you, there was nobody. I've, I've watched the play a couple of times. Uh, there was nobody. There was, there was nobody basically down. It was Casey Morcello setting the screen uh, for Hauser. So uh, there was no. There was no intent. It didn't seem to, to try to get to the to the rim there. After a day where they tried to get to the rim the whole day, <laughs> they they decided to shoot a three at the end and a contested one at that. But uh, angry Jay Huff would have would have shot that ball and snarled after he makes a shot. <laughs> I wrote that in the column and. Uh, we didn't see that, uh, unfortunately, today. So um, talking with, uh, you know, as, as Coach Bennett talked after the game with reporters, um, you know, coaches, I mean, obviously, they want to go out there. Coaches and players all want to go out and win every game. Uh, I pointed out in the postgame column that, hey, you know, the national champions dating back to the last undefeated national champion, which was Indiana back in 76. I was four years old. I am 48 now. So older than that um but the last the last what would that be 40 43 champions i guess if you can go to going to virginia uh in 2019 we're still defending champs right um they've lost at least twice nobody's gone even in a whole season and lost once and been a national champ kentucky was 38 no a few years ago lost in the final four i think um uh unlv was 34 and oh back in the early 90s and lost in the final four um, no national champ has lost less than twice uh, in the last 40 plus years. Um, and so it's not about going undefeated. And of course, Virginia's lost her second game of the season. So pressure's off. You don't have to worry about being undefeated, right? Um, it's about how you come back from a defeat, what you learn when you lose, uh, and how you correct for that. And so um, this Virginia team uh, now goes in the annals of a couple of recent pretty good Virginia teams and losing their second game of the season to a team that no one thought they'd, well, I don't, I don't know. This, the first one was the 2013-2014 team, lost its um, second game to home opener to, uh, I think it was home opener, VCU, hit, hit a three at the buzzer to beat Virginia. I want to say the score of that game was 59-56. Um, and, uh, and then the 2015-2016 team uh, went up to George Washington and lost 73-68. And this one felt more like that one. The VCU game, I don't know. It didn't feel the same. I mean, that game was a back and forth game. That VCU team went to the NCAA tournament that year. Um, and, and the 2015, 2016 team went to the elite eight Virginia did. Uh, and the GW team was pretty good. They ended up not getting an NCAA bid, went and won the, and won the NIT they finished 28 and 10 that year. Neither of those losses were, were losses you hang your hat on and say, that's, you know, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have done that. Um, but I guess the GW loss of those two would feel that way more. This San Francisco team may surprise us. I mean, I, mean, I mentioned they, were, they won 22 last year. They lost in the West Coast Tournament Final uh, by four points to Gonzaga's second four-point loss to Gonzaga last year for that San Francisco team. Yeah, they lost by eight to UMass Lowell. Uh, that, that will not now define their visit to Bubbleville. This will define their visit to Bubbleville, their first one over a top five since 1981. Um, but, you know, I guess what it says is you've got to respect your opponent. Tony Bennett talked after the game about – uh, you know, just what that means. Uh, you know, you got to go out there. He, he felt like uh, what we felt. Like. If you watched the game, and you did. That's why you're watching me now, listening to me now, trying to give, help, have me help you make sense of it. Um, you know, his, his take of it, in fact, I'll quote him, look at it in the mirror, grow from it, forget about it. If you at all think we won the first game handily, look at our ranking, we've all been down that road. We have to keep being as good as we can be, and that's just not coach speak. We got to harden up. We got to get gritty. We got to be tougher to score against and be the best version of ourselves. And today, Virginia was not the best version of themselves. Got to seven nothing lead early. It was eleven three at one point, um, and then you know it, it just felt like after that, Virginia went one for sixteen in one stretch in the first half. A long stretch, almost thirteen minute long stretch of the first half. One for sixteen from the floor. Now they play such good defense that at the end of a 13 minute stretch going one for 16 from the floor. They made a three pointer uh, and had a lead. So, I mean, that, that says a lot about Virginia. Uh, got the lead up early in the second half to seven. Uh, then San Francisco goes on an 11 0 run. Virginia gets the lead back to five after a little flurry by Tomas Wolotensai. 
And then Kia Clark fouls a three-point shooter who makes the shot, makes the four-point play. And uh, then, I mean, you know, give Virginia credit. So they, they played themselves out of pulling away a couple times that looked like they might be on the verge of doing so. And then when San Francisco got a 61-54 lead uh, with about two and a half minutes to go, uh, Virginia, uh, who couldn't get stops, <laughs> it didn't seem like in the second half at all, got stops, got points. Uh, Justin McCoy looked like he got fouled on his little drive with a basket with 30 seconds left, that he made the basket to make it a one-point game, didn't call the foul. Uh, but, you know, they got back to one. They, they got the ball back and had the last shot. Um, there's, there's something to be learned there. I mean, it's hard for Virginia fans, I'm sure, who are watching this or listening to me on the archive, uh, to, to understand this because two days ago we thought we had just seen the best Virginia team we'd ever seen. That Towson team we beat the other day was pretty good too. They won 19 in the CAA last year. Pretty good team at Towson team. And, and Virginia blew them blew the doors off early and, and kept the foot on the throttle thereafter in a 35-point win. Um, you, you know, so to see, to go from there two days later to losing by a point to a team that on paper you say they're San Francisco. Who are they? There's no Bill Russell there. That's not, they're not that San Francisco. Um, but, uh, this is, I mean, part of this is how you respond. This is how you get better. And, uh, uh, you'll, they'll learn. I mean, if, if that last shot goes down, um, I don't know that, uh, Virginia played any better. They would have just got the W and of course we wanted the W, but sometimes you need something to rattle your cage a bit. And, and definitely Tony Bennett's got something to rattle his guys' cages now. Um, you know, you're going to see some more work on the back end of the pack line. I certainly think Sam Hauser is. Because now, now opponents have a blueprint. Uh, San Francisco with, with, you know, playing the five high, you'd be silly not to try it if you had the players to run it. Not everybody can run five high. Uh, you know, not everybody's got five ball handlers to, to be able to, to break down dribbler, uh, to break down defenders with the dribble. But um, if you can do it, you know, you, you'd be, you know, you'd be silly not to try it. Uh, and so Virginia's going to clearly have to work on that. Uh, defensively. You're going to have to work on the offensive side. I mean, you know, the, uh, you know, Jay Billis is pointing out uh, on the broadcast today on, on ESPN that, you know, you didn't, see, he, he said you didn't see any mover blocker. I saw, I saw mover blocker. I saw a lot of, of the screening action that you normally see out of mover blocker, but you did see more uh, of, you know, Virginia running some different sets. I mean, the first two games, we saw P.A. Clark catching passes basically in the post with his, his defender on his back uh, trying to establish offense uh, from a, from a sort of a face up position, like you'd think you'd see Anthony Gill in from a few years ago, uh, you know, twelve feet from the basket, turning around uh, and, and seeing if he can find a cutter, uh, dribble driving into the lane, either for a kick out or for a short jump shot. Um, you know, some different things that things that certainly weren't even run for Ty Jerome. I would have, I think, Ty Jerome would thrive with with those kind of sets. Um, and so, you know, you because you've got more weapons, they did you know just for whatever reason today. The guys who were so good two days ago didn't even largely get uh, shots today. Sam Hauser was eventually five for 11. He made four in a row in the second half, missed the last shot. But, you know, up, up until the 745 mark, he had one basket. Uh, at that same point, Jay Huff also had one basket. Uh, he'd only shot the ball once by that point. Uh, Trey Murphy the third uh, had 21 points the other day. He was 0 for 6 from the floor today. He had four points off from the foul line all in early in the first half. Um, not getting looks for those guys. Five assists on 21 made baskets. The ball wasn't moving today. Uh, Virginia is going to be better when the ball moves. You know, they've got players who can, who can create, who can score, who can spot up, who can finish. But, you know, no team is going to be that effective with a bunch of ice with them. So work on that. Work on the help defense. This team's fine. This, you know, it, it sucks that Virginia lost today. But just – um, in fact, yeah, I think that we saw some things today in defeat. Reese Beekman emerging, Justin McCoy emerging. Um, you know, uh, th this is the kind of game that you need to play. There's going to be a game in March, and we know this from two years ago. Um, that team going into the NCAA tournament was 29-3. and three. They'd lost twice to Duke, the best team any of us had ever seen in our lives until they didn't make the Final Four. Um, and they'd lost once to a really good Florida State team, uh, but had beaten everybody else. And for the most part, had beaten them pretty handily. Um, 
And, and But you knew going into that NCAA tournament that year, hey, you're going to have to win some ugly games. We didn't realize how many ugly games that Virginia was going to have to win. They, in fact, every one of those games, even the Gardner-Webb game where the final score was, I think, 71-54, you're down at halftime to Gardner Webb, the 16 seed. You know, the Oklahoma game was maybe the easiest of, 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 of the six. Um, and there was even a time late in the first half when he was down to Oklahoma. But then, you know, the ugly, ugly game, winning ugly against Oregon in the Sweet 16. And then, you know, the rally late and beating Purdue in overtime when they're throwing everything in the basket. Everything that Carson Edwards threw towards the rim went in. You know, the Auburn game where you almost collapsed historically late. And then you you make up for it with six points in the last seven seconds. Uh, national championship game similar. You have a ten point lead late, and, and then they, they they are poised to win. You pull it out and win an overtime. Um, today's game you lose, but you this team learned. Hey, we're down sixty one fifty four two minutes to go. We can get it back. Um, you learn a couple things. One, we can fight our way back on a day when nothing's going right for us. Again, everything went perfectly for San Francisco today. 40 points in the second half, 1.9 possessions. Virginia getting just five assists on 17 or on 21 made baskets. It was just that everything happened for San Francisco that needed to happen. And they won by one point only because Sam Howells missed the last shot. Um, if you're Virginia, what you do is you say, okay, we're not going to have too many days where things like that happen, where everything goes wrong for us, everything goes right for the other guys. Uh, and, and we will lose by one. So, if we just work a little harder, play a little bit better defense, finish the rim more, take contact instead of shying away from it, uh, move the ball around a little bit better, we're going to win a lot of games. Uh, and we got more players now uh, that we, you know, Reese Beekman and Justin McCoy they feel like they came they came of age today. So um, I'm going to I'm going to write write this off. It's a loss. Sucks. There, there's going to be growth from this. I'm I'm fine with it. Um, so let's quickly, because <laughs> I talked a lot more about basketball than I thought I would, uh, especially because I didn't have to cede the microphone over anybody, Scott or Jerry or my wife, Crystal, who ask questions or I ask questions of too. Um, quickly, we'll just go into UVA Florida State uh, because that's tomorrow night, 8 o'clock ACC Network. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to pull this up here real quick. Uh, it's, the, the story is falling off the page. The, uh, uh, one of the two previews I did couple quick things, uh, and then we'll talk about Florida State in depth. Uh, UVA uh, favored by uh, the line open at minus 10. Now it's eight and a half to nine and a half. The over under is 58.5. Suggest a final score somewhere in a range of 34 or 35 to 24 or 25, somewhere there. Um, when you, before you say, uh, you know, you're just pulling numbers out of the air with one, that's what Vegas is saying. I've only started doing this the last couple of weeks, but last week the over-under and the margin suggested the EVA win of 49-10. It's pretty much what it should have been <laughs> until, until the last few seconds happened. <laughs> so Vegas kind of gets this right most of the time, or at least close. Um, EVA banged up on D. Joey Blunt should be back. Um, I heard in the press box last week. Got to be in the press box the first time in a long, long time. It was great. Uh, heard in the press box, uh, not anything official, but Blunt would, could have been back last week. And, you know, they're playing Abilene Christian. Why push it that far? So, but he should be back for Florida State. Um, senior linebacker Charles Snowden, of course, is done for the season in ankle surgery. And Juwan Briggs is in Cincinnati. He's heading to Cincinnati, at least. I'm sure he'll finish his semester up on ground in Charlottesville and then headed to Cincinnati. Going back home. Uh, and, you know, can't fault the guy for going back home. Uh, speaking of going back home, we're back on the ACC Network. First seven games of the season were on the ACC Network. Last week we were on Masson, which was picking up the broadcast of the regional sports networks. Uh, I didn't get to watch a broadcast because I was in a press box. Yeah, I get me, but um, I guess maybe this is my punishment. I get, I get, just like the rest of you, get to watch the ACC Network and those endless loops of tackle and drum commercials, all those in house. ACC promo fillers, the magic sunglasses, that electric razor you can use underwater. <laughs> and not only that, but we're playing late, <laughs> eight o'clock. Uh, you know, so, I mean, it, Broncos talked about how hard it is to play at eight o'clock anyway, much less in this COVID era, because, you know, even, even on you know, normal era, eight o'clock kickoff, seven or seven, seven thirty or eight o'clock kickoffs are, are tough because, you know, when you, when you do them, uh, you just sit around all day, and now 
in the COVID era, not only are you just sitting around all day, you're sitting around your hotel room all day because you can't go out and you can't expose yourself to anything. So, um, and for your friendly neighborhood sports writer, uh, an eight o'clock kickoff means an 11:15 final snap, and that means a long night of writing stories to get to get to. Because to me, think about it now, it's 5:47 as I'm finishing up this show here. Um, I finished up my writing on the EVA game. We started at 11:30. I finished up the writing about 4:45. So from start to finish, that's five hours and um, 15 minutes. And basketball games are only two hours long. Add another hour for that and you get a good feel for, that's two in the morning. I'm looking forward to Saturday night. So my Sunday's already wrecked. Um, and real quick on um, one last thing here about, I, I, I did a column today. What UVE football fans need to know about Florida State. Here's a couple of things. One, Florida State, they were one and three and beat UNC, which UNC was ranked number five in the country. Now I think they might climb back in the top 25 now. In fact, yeah, they're 19 of playing Notre Dame uh, this weekend. Uh, Florida State was one and three and had 31 7 lead at half, held on for the 31 28 win. And if, I was thinking this, maybe you were thinking this too, if you were following that night. They got it fixed. You know, they're two and three now. They're, they're going to be back against Florida State. They just beat the heck out of Carolina, even though the final score was three points. They were up 31 7 half. Three straight losses since then 48 16 at Louisville, 41 17 to Pitt, 38 22 at NC State. And they had two Robert Sound TVs to make that one look better. They were down 35 9 starting the fourth quarter. Um, Mike Norville's two and six in his first season. Willie Taggart went five and seven and six and seven. Jimbo Fisher last season, they were seven and six. When you're talking about a Florida State program that was five years prior, it was 59 and nine, one national championship, one college football playoff semifinal loss. Um, they had two 10 win seasons that felt like, God, what did we do wrong? We only won 10. And now they're two and six. Um, they should have Jordan Travis back. He's their starting quarterback. But when I say that, they've had to play four quarterbacks this year. But so when I say they've got their starter back, you think, okay, well, maybe now things get better. He's actually played in seven games of their eight. He missed the NC State game, got hurt in the pit game, but he played until halftime of that game. Um, his stats aren't the greatest, but he is the guy that they anointed the starter. Um, the offense, you know, they've, they've only got one win over a, a FC, F, F, FBS. I can never get this right. FBS team. They beat Jacksonville State also this year. Um, so they've only got the one win over Carolina in the FBS. Um, their issue is a little bit of offense. I mean, they're 13th in the ACC in total offense, 370 yards a game. Florida State? I mean, they have Heisman winners at quarterback. They you know, guys like Warwick Dunn and running back and all those receivers they've had over the years. And then, you know, they don't have that this year. 13th in the ACC in total offense. Their defense is maybe more shockingly bad because, you know, we would pay attention to those high-octane offenses, but their defenses were so good back in the Bobby Bowden era. They're 11th in total defense and 14th in scoring defense this year. Now, there's one guy that is old-school Florida State quality. He's even got an old-school Florida State name, Asante Samuel Jr. Uh, his pro football focus grade is 81.8. This kid's going to play in the, in, on Sundays. Um, 32 tackles. Listen to these numbers. So whoever he's covering tomorrow, we're not throwing to. <laughs> 278 pass coverage snaps, 32 targets. That tells you one thing. And they're only 19 of 32. And the opponent passer rating on those 32 passes is 46.2. Um, that's the NFL passer rating. That the NFL, you're 0 for 1. If you don't get the ball intercepted, your passer rating is 39. So this is barely better than an incomplete pass is what he gives up. Um, but aside from Asante Samuel, it's, it's, it's nothing. I mean, it's, you know, the lack of the pass rush, um, pro football focus ranks their pass rush 116 out of 127 teams in FBS. Um, they don't get pressure. They give up lots of yards on the ground. Um, you know, this, this is, you know, I, I think what happened here is Jimbo Fisher saw the writing on the wall, like maybe he'd stop recruiting towards the end, uh, or, you know, whatever was going on there. And he took the, I, I wrote this in the column, he took a $75 million parachute to <laughs> Texas A&M. He's getting them turned around a little bit. Um, but uh, Willie Taggart didn't recruit, didn't stop the cupboard, and now Mike Norville is left to pick up the pieces. And he's about to go to the grocery store a couple of times, get it all, get it all ready before he can cook a good dinner. I'm using that word terminology there. 
So that's tomorrow night. Virginia favorite on the road at Florida State. I know that, you know, the name brand is what gets you. So you go, wow, we're going to go favored by nine at Florida State. Um, but that's tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. And um, that'll wrap us up here, I think, for the show. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. And um, until we meet again, we'll talk soon. <laughs>